Father Lord, we thank you for once again bringing us into your presence to fellowship with you. Many sought to see today, but they never saw it. But Lord, we saw it and we rejoice and we are glad because this is the day you have made that we should rejoice and be glad in it. We should celebrate your favor, your goodness, your mercy, your compassion towards us. You are the Lord and that is your name. Your glory cannot be given to another. Your praise cannot be given to either. What shall we say therefore? If God be for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his holy son. He gave him as an atonement. We know through him he will give us all things. Lord, today we have gathered together once again to have fellowship with you. Lord, you says, if we have fellowship with you, we are showing your debt until you come. Lord, today we have gathered together in that fellowship to present ourselves to the Lord, just as the sons of God present themselves before the Lord. To exalt you, we have presented ourselves with our infirmities we have come, with our righteousness we have come, with our deficiency we have come, with our knowledge we have come, with our wisdom we have come, with our foolishness we have come, to present ourselves before you, as we have boldly come to the throne of grace, to ask you for help in this time of need. Lord, meet us at the very point of our need, because you promise us that the expectation of the righteous will never be cut off. Our expectation today will not be cut off. Father Lord, as many that will come to this lesson, O oh Lord, with a heavy heart, with body of mind, with sickness, with infirmities, Lord, they will not return home the same. Because you say, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily laden, I will give you rest. Lord, they have come to lean on you because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Lord, you will grant rest to your soul. You will roll away every burden from their heart. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today, brethren, we have welcome again to the Open House Fellowship. This is CGF Open House Fellowship. It is a non-denominational fellowship. Our service is Tuesday from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And this Tuesday, we have another exciting new topic, which is Jesus, God's missionary, God choosing missionary. And this topic is a topic we have a heavy mind towards because it teaches us that the mission job we are sent to do did not start with us. That God has one son and he made that son a missionary. And that son has preached the gospel ever since, from the foundation of the earth, even till now. Now he has called us to finish the work he started. And he says, these signs will follow them that believe. In his name they will cast out them, will heal all manner of disease, lay their hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. Today, if you are bold enough to hearken unto the word of Jesus Christ, and keep to that mission promise, that he has commanded you with a great commission, which is his last command, that you should go, that this sign will follow you. The sign will surely follow every believer, no matter wherever you are in the world, that decide to obey this call and go in faith. These signs will not come with you in the house, but as you go, the sign will follow you. This I pray for you in Jesus' name. Today, I am your host, my name is Missionary Collins Adoge. I am your minister for tonight. Our topic today is Jesus, God choosing missionary. Jesus, God choosing missionary. Why would God have one son and decide to choose him as a missionary to the world? That shows you a heart of love which the Father has shown towards the world. Not only that he, we love him, but because he loved us. And because he loved us, he sent his holy son and made him a missionary to the world, so that through him the world might be saved. And today, a true story, a group of Western missionaries went so to a far away land, uninvited, without consulting the national church. Each local believers were suspicious. And the missionaries soon became isolated from fellowship. 
for years they kept their own language, culture, food, ways of working and worshipping. Even today, anyone who comes to their church services feel an outsider after a while and move on. So, why do we start this teaching with this service? Because when God sent His Son, who should be our example to be a missionary to the world, His Son did not come into the world and say, My mission is to die for the world. Go straight to the cross, no consultation, not try to blend into the society, keep the heavenly standard, in fact, retain His godly nature. The death of Christ will make no sense to the world. In fact, we will not even recognize that he died for ourselves. But when God made his son a missionary, what was his strategy? How did he do it? If we know how he do it, the rest are sure we can apply the same formula and do the same thing. But how did God send his son? First, God did not send his son as an angel or in a vision. To come to the earth, or as the voice of God that speaks from heaven to come to the world. No. First, he followed biblical prophecy. He was counted among us. The Bible said he was numbered among men. God has his son come to the earth. Though he be in form of a God, he taught it not robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation. And he took upon himself the form of a servant. He did not even take the form of a king or of a world popular ruler or of a leader, but he took the form of a servant. And he became obedient even to the point of death, even such a shameful death on the cross. That's why, for you to be accepted into the community as a missionary, you may have all the money in the world. Go into a camp. Dressed with fine shoe and long tie may make you acceptable in congregational church, but not in the mission field. But if you go in as the village farmer, as the cattle bearer, and you go in as an apprentice in a workshop, as mechanic that feeds their vehicle, they will listen more to you than if you go in there carrying long Bible as a religion priest and writes on your chest, missionary, people will not listen to you because they look at you as a foreigner. But if you come to their place and they see you participate in their market day, join them in their farm and their cultural practice, when you speak to them as missionary, they will listen to you. And that is why today many missionaries find it difficult to be accepted in some community. It's not because the community are evil themselves. Because missionaries should learn to fit to the culture. Paul said, I become all things to all men, that by every means I may win some. That is the spirit of a missionary. The spirit of a missionary is to become all things to all people. So that at the point in time, you can save some of them. The people that need saving are not gathered together in congregational church. Some of them are in the village local farm. Some of them are in the beer parlor. Some of them are in the hotel. Some of them are in the hollow street joint. Some people that need saving are in the academic institution. They may never have the opportunity to visit the church all through their life because the God of this world has prevented them. They are living in depravity. They cannot be saved. So what do you do? How do you present Christ to people that are unaccessible? Is to become those people. To an academician, become an academician. To a mechanic, become a mechanic. To a farmer, become like a farmer. So that you can by every means save some. If you want to save a market woman, they would rather listen to a market woman than a pastor that say I'm an evangelist crying in the market. So, use market women to reach market women. Use farmer to reach farmer. Use mechanic to reach mechanic. Use tailor to reach tailor. Use religious zealot to reach religious zealot. And use traditional zealot to reach traditional zealot. This will help you forward the message of the mission and make the Great Commission swift and wonderful for the whole world to see. And that's why today we are very happy 
under this topic that Jesus himself, when he came into the earth, did not come in form of a king, though he was a god. He did not think it as a thing of robbery to be equal with God. But what does he do? He did not come in the house of Herod, who was the king then in those days, but he came in the house of a capital whose name was Joseph. And he came from a virgin named Mary, who was a betrothed to Joseph. He was numbered among men. Though he was a god, but he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But he humbled himself and he became obedient. He did not disobey his spirit at any point in time. He followed them and they grew with him. Even when they left him in the temple and he made it known to them that he was in his father's house, he still followed them home in obedience to them. His ministry did not start at one year old to prove to the world that I am different, I am a son of a God. No, he waited until he was a matured man to minister. After having learned from the elders and the stripes and the Pharisees, he learned from God, Holy Spirit, with wisdom and direction, so that he can be qualified to preach the gospel to all men. Today, what does this teach us as ministers of God? That, yes, many are called, but that the reason why God chose few is so that he may preserve a godly seed. You are all called to finish the Great Commission, but God expects, even when He called you, for you to conform to His standard. The same standard that Jesus followed. Jesus has a mind that was in Him, but if you must be His follower, let this same mind be in you. He was in form of a God, but He did not see it as a thing of pride. To be in the same equality with God. But what does he do? He humbled himself in humility and became so obedient, even to the point of death, he was obedient. And he was faithful to him that chose him, even as a servant or as a son to his own house, he was faithful. He was hanged on a wooden cross, though he created the tree from where the cross came from. But yet did he not leave the cross at any point and said, I'm out of here. Even when they spat on him, say, if thou art the Christ, come down from the cross, we will believe in you. He did not came to prove himself that he was indeed the servant of God. There may be a point in your ministry where people say, yes. They brought in one cripple and said, look. If you say you are the servant of God, raise he these people. Do not do it for the form of it. The miracles and the election and the salvation of God are for a divine purpose. The purpose is to lead people to God. It's not to show that you can do wonders or signs or do great things in the name of God. That's why when you are in your house, no matter the power of the Holy Spirit in you, if you lay hand on the sick inside your house, try to test the power of God before you go for mission, it will never work. The reason is not because the power is not in you, it's because God will not give his glory to any man. The glory of the Lord is for himself, and he preserves it for himself alone. He will not give it to any man. But when you step out in obedience and follow what he said, God will honor his word. Because the Bible told me that the Lord honored his word more than even his name. Some people honored their name, but God honored his name. At the name of Jesus, every name will bow. Till tomorrow, that's why when you mention the name of Jesus, every name bow. But yet, God tells you he honored his word more than that name. No matter how powerful the mention of the name of Jesus is, God tells me to tell you today that he honor his word more than that name. And today, we are looking at why God will send his only son to be a missionary to the world, to give us an example on how we should preach the gospel. If this gospel is so important, why did God not send angels? Why did he not do it himself? Why would he send us 
who were made in his image after his likeness. Because God also did not choose angels to become king and priest unto him, but he chose the church. Because you are a royal priesthood, a choosing generation, a peculiar people, who should show forth the praise of God who has called you out of darkness. The whole world lives in darkness, and darkness cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But that's why God allowed his glory to rise upon you. That's why he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He knew in time past you were not a people. You were not even part of the covenant of promise with Abraham, which God made with Israel. But now you are his people. Why? Because of Christ. Because of his death, you have been reunited with the covenant of Abraham. Now you are God's people. Now you are a peculiar nation. Now you are a royal priesthood. Now you are a chosen generation. And your job is to show forth the glory of God in this present world. And his message to all generations following. And that's why today, this lesson is going to be very easy and technical. For many believers, it's going to be the lesson that you need to energize you and prepare you for the job and for the work of the ministry. Sadly, but not surprisingly, the work has grown very much. The faithful missionary blamed the people for being hard-hearted. But is that the whole truth? No. The people are not hard-hearted as you think. Then you are presenting to them a culture they do not know. I remember when I was in mission in Africa, the first question they asked me is, Oh, the Bible you are preaching is it not a white man Bible? You are teaching us a white man gospel. Why not teach our local tradition that our father understand, our knowledge understand? But they will not ask the same question if you try to explain to them that this God we are talking about has name in every culture. It has cultural significance. Your grandfather and your great grandfather knew there was a God. And they knew that He is the ruler of the entire universe. But they don't know how to worship. That's why they make all idols and form. Look at what Paul did when he got to Item. When Paul got to Item, he saw that the people were very religious. They make all form of idol to different kind of God. Even to the extent they make an idol and say, we do not know your name, to your no God. And this fascinates Paul. Because why? These people did not only make idols to other gods that are known, they also make to one to an unknown one, which they do not know, but they worship. Then, Paul now made them to understand that he has not come to show them any of those other gods who they already know. But this one they do not know. He has come to show them. And he used that their idol to preach to them. You can still do the same today. But using the same idol which the people claim to worship as a symbol, make known to them that which they know not, which they worship ignorantly, have you come to declare to them. And these people will listen more than when you come to them with a strange religion. But because Paul spoke to them about their unknown God, many of them said we will hear you today on this decision. So Christians should be very fought with whenever they are in the mission field. That's why in CGF we have a strategy that when we get to the mission, first of all, we follow Christ's method. We suffer whoever has right or whoever has authority in the community. And then we abide throughout our days of mission. And this gives room for trust. And because the man who is in authority knows his community better than any other person, he is in the position to explain to the mission team and to the people of the community that these people, though they are strangers, they have come with this. This is their mission. And this is the purpose why God sent them here. And because of this purpose, let's listen to what they have to say. The people tend to trust you more than when you go there without trusting on anybody. You have to give respect to the king and supreme. 
and you have to give respect to the custom and to every man that has authority in that community, whether to the priest or to the local deity or to the local church, you have to give respect to every single man. And that's not mean you bowing down to their idol to worship them, but that means you allowing yourself to be integrated into the community in order for the gospel of God not to be blamed. Remember that the king is God's servant for justice. And if you disobey him, you should realize that he bear not the sword in vain. He left purity and perfection of his home in heaven. And he came to the world stricken with sin, sickness, selfishness, demon, poverty. That was Christ. And in Psalm 2, we could understand that when the Son of God responded to the Father, he responded to the Father in Psalm 2. He came unto the world. He, the, he crossed the ultimate cultural barrier. He left the purity and perfection of his home in heaven. To come to the world stricken with sin. A world that was now in destruction because of sin, sickness, selfishness, demon possessed, and poverty. How did he come? He came to the Jewish people as a Jewish baby boy with a Jewish spirit. Jesus chose to be born like most people, poor, not rich, religious not powerful. He lives in the family of an ordinary working man and learn about the people. Like everyone else, he knew. He knew what heat looked like. He knew what cold looked like. He knew what hunger and Roman coiety looked like. Some of us today, when we are called into mission, first thing we ask God is, God, where is the money? How many containers of cars or money have you given us private jet before we can go into the ministry? Ask those ministers that got to the stage that God promoted to have personal car, personal jet, personal house. They did not start with personal jets. They started in the streets. They started by gathering one or two people together. They started by laboring hard with all their heart for God. And as a result, the blessing came. So you must also understand that just like Christ, if you labor for God with your heart, without minding the benefits that comes with the work, the blessing also, God will not mind the manner of blessing by which he blessed you. And that's why he said, because he poured out his soul to death, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that was above all names. When he was on earth, his name was not openly doors. But when he got to heaven, God gave him a name that was above all names. That's why right tomorrow, at the name of Jesus, any names on earth bowed, whether the political name, whether the spiritual name, whether the physical name, they bowed at his name. That is because he humbled himself to the point of death. So Christians must learn to humble themselves even to the point of death in order to be exalted by God. It is written about me in the scroll, he said. I have come to do what? Thy will, O God. I have come to do thy will, O God. That was what was written about Christ. He did not come to do his own will. Let's take a hint at the book of Genesis, chapter 1, chapter 11, from verse 1 to 9. What does it say? The whole earth was one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. And they formed for themselves a plain. They formed a plain in the land of China. And they went there. And they said one to another, Go to. Let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stones, lime, 
had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach up to heaven. Let us make us a name, lest us be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, this people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Now nothing will be refrained from them. They have imagined to do. So why would God wonder about the people in Bethel? In the people in Babel, the Bible makes us understand that the journey east, they discover that they don't want to go to the in the likeness of the rest of the earth. They don't want to be scattered abroad. They want something more. They want to build a tower for themselves. And they want the tower to reach up to heaven. They want to make name, not for God, for themselves. So that they will not be scattered in the earth. But God understands. But that was not his plan for man. Remember what he told man in the creation. He said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. But man has refused to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth and to replenish it and to subdue it. Because the people were one. And they have what? One singular language. They came from one parent. They do not want their family to be scattered. They wanted to build a city and make themselves a name. Maybe a red one word king among themselves. Just does that seem familiar today? Today we have many people who does not want the world to be scattered. They want the world to be one. They want to gather the world together and remake it in their image. And so that the world will be one and the people one language. That was the plan. But that was not God's plan. Somebody may wonder, ah, why would God bother? Can they go build the house that enter into the cloud? That was not the point. God wants men to cover the earth. To be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth and to multiply it. He don't want to gather the whole world together in one street. Today we keep building house on top of houses. Why the earth is full with forest? Because that is what man wants. Men always like unity. As long as the people are one, they speak the same language. They all want to live together. But God discovered something was wrong. That these people were one and they have one mind. What is the purpose of the people being one and they have one mind? That means the moment we Christian we are one and we have one mind with the people we have come to say, nothing will be restrained from us. There is nothing we set our hearts to do that will be impossible. But if we have a divided mind, we will not succeed. But if we are united, we will always prevail. That's why the Bible himself tells us how peaceful is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the oil that is poured into the head of Aaron that ran down toward the garment of his scalp, down down his bed. And that is like the dew of the Lord upon Mount Hammer, where God combined his blessing, even life forevermore. So that is how peaceful is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. Because when brethren dwell together in unity, there is nothing that is restrained from them. Whatever they set their heart to do, they will achieve it. But today, why, what is stopping the church? Some claim I am for Paul. The other one claim I am for Peter. The other one claim I am for John. I remember the first conference we had in Ogbe. We were able to gather the churches together of different fashions, all in one place in the name of God, and to preach the gospel and to teach and to hold conference with them. The crusade was the best I've ever had in Zambia in the nation. The reason is because the people were one and their mind was one, and nothing was restrained from us, and no sign was impossible in that conference. The reason is because the people were one and they have one mind. Do you want your church to blossom with power of God 
and the fulfillment of the apostolic lead. You want the same Holy Spirit like the apostle received in the beginning that prepared them for mission? Let your mind be one. And let the people be one. Nothing you start in your ministry will be restrained from you. It's not about how long you fast, how many years you pray. It's because the people continue in one accord. They break bread with the singleness of hearts. And as a result of that, nothing was restrained from them. And nothing was impossible for them to do. It takes unity to build. And it takes division to scatter. If you must build a house for God, you must learn to figure out how to work with others. No matter how powerful you are, as a minister or as a gospel teacher, you can never do the work of God alone. No matter how intelligent you think you are, your knowledge can never supersede that of the entire world. So you must learn to understand that everybody needs each other to survive. I need you, you need me. We all need each other to survive. You may have the money, but somebody else has the knowledge. You may have the knowledge, somebody else has the money. You may have both the knowledge and money, somebody else has the manpower. So we need each other to survive. God makes the fingers and the body, member of our body, as a symbol to us to make us understand that as Christians, we are not all supreme, that we need one another to survive. That's why all the gifts of the Holy Spirit were not compacted in one hand. But they were shared. He made some teacher, some evangelist, some pastor, some prophet, so that united the church can be invisible. The gate of hell can never prevent against us. But divided, the church is free. And the gate of hell will take dominion over it. Because as a church of God, the only way to avoid the gate of hell from prevailing over the church is for the church to be bonded together in unity. And let every man respect his office and use the appropriate gift that God has given us to do the work which he has called us to do. Now, in the book of Hebrew chapter 10, Hebrew chapter 10, I will read from verse 7. Hebrew 10, verse 7. What of this six? Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of thy book as it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Because God does not require sacrifice or burnt offering. In verse 6, he said, In burnt offering and sacrifice of sin, that has no pressure. In verse 7, he said, Lo, I come in the volume of thy book, O Lord, to do thy will. I come in the volume of thy book to do thy will, O Lord, as it is written of me. Psalm 40, verse 6 to 8. When it was God's time, he ministered to the Jewish people in their own language. He did not come with the language of an angel or speak in tongues to the Jewish people. Or speak in Hebrew, in uh, Greek to Jewish, or speak Hebrew to Jewish to Greek. No, that was not how he ministers. He ministered to them in that local diet. The people understand him. They knew him to be one of them. Remember when he went to his own town to preach? What did they say? Is this not Jesus, the son of Jesse, and Joseph, who is, and the brother of John, Jesse? Whose brothers and sisters we know and they are with us to these days, they knew him as one of them. Sometimes it work as an advantage, sometimes it work as disadvantage. Because sometimes when they know you do for familiarity, you may make them not to listen to the word of God. But sometimes knowing you matters to them. That means they know that they can trust you. When it was God time, he ministered to them as Jewish people in their own local language. He respected Jewish custom and custom. He did not brew up their tradition because he has come as the ultimate power. No. He respected their culture and custom. He was also one with the people that when the soldier came to arrest him, they had to be shown which man was Jesus. 
because it was not different from the disciple. So when you when they come into your church and you and your mission team are sitting down and they can identify you different, say this one like the pastor, the rest are members. There is a problem. Because if you are the pastor and you can be identified from the group, that means the mission team has a problem. When they come into the team of Jesus Christ, they never knew whether Peter was Jesus or whether John was Jesus because they all dressed like Hebrew and they all acted like Hebrew men. There was no leader and they were all equal before God. And this should be a lesson to people who will be missionaries to learn to put God first, not yourself first. To put, if by the time you go through every mission today with a bottle of water and a cup of ice cream in your hand, how many villages do you really think you can reach in the world? What happens to the village where they have no fridge? Are you going to spend the mission income to carry fridge from village to village? Or to gather bottled water for Five years mission. What of if God put you on a 20 years mission? How many bottles of water can you buy for the space of 20 years? God is asking you a question. Raise and train ordinary local people. After this resurrection, he left them to it, trusting these friends to do the work of the ministry. Can you see the difference? People in the first story brought God love, expected people to enter their culture. When Jesus brought God love, he fully entered into the culture to win us to heaven. So you see the difference. Enter into the culture as Jesus did. Is culture a barrier or a career? What is culture? It's an integrated lifestyle of language, habit, custom, social organization, and gives people identity and distinction. Culture is about behavior, body language, relation, greeting. It is how people talk, eat, dress, walk, sing, play, and do business. You can see culture is architecture, religious beauty in a choosing system of government, law, schools. You can see culture in the respect, in the respect or lack of it. For official and in attitude towards privacy and time. In culture, is culture good or bad? In Genesis 1 11, verse 1 to 9, and all chapter 10 show us that culture originated in God. Who scattered men into nations for centuries since then it was evolved today jesus sent us to make disciples of every ethnos every culture or culture group and on the last day people from every culture will worship around god's throne culture is a great carrier of the gospel not a barrier at all why? Because once the first local receive Christ, they can take the good news to their people in the way they understand best. Look at the Samaritan woman. Would Jesus have been able to run around the whole town of Samaria saying, come and see the man that told me all that I ever did? No. He met the woman of Samaria and the war and he gave the gospel to the ethno. And when the ethno of Samaria heard the gospel, what does she do? She went straight ahead into the city. Come and see the man that told me all that I ever did. And what happened? The elders and the whole city came to listen to Jesus. He abode with them for three days, teaching them the gospel. And after that, they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what I have said, but because we have heard ourselves that this is indeed the Christ. So that is what the ethnos can be very effective with little guidance, helping you to gather people for the ministry. Why? Because once the first local receive Christ, they can then take the good news to their people in a way they understand best. 
like Jesus, the missionary can then withdraw and support the locals. That is why in CGF, our mission strategies remain the same way Christ operates. We take the message to the place, lay the landmarks, then employ the locals to do the mission while we withdraw and plan for other food. This has been a culture that has worked for us several years, and we believe if you apply it to your church and mission, it will also work best. God's missionaries always adapt. Love for a people means a big change in order to relate to them. Watch out. If you, if people irritate you, you can never push to them. If you feel irritated by others' character, by their behavior, you will find it difficult to be able to lead them to Christ. For you to be able to lead people to Christ, you must love the man, not the same. No matter their color, their behavior, their feeding style, their lifestyle, how irritating it is, always realize one thing. They were made in God's image, just as you are. Understand that basis. Love will flow from natural hearts and it will cover all their shortcoming and their inability. I remember once I was in the world, I easily flew up with people and ready to fight. But when I became a Christian, gradually I discovered that I began to see good in people, not ready to fight irrespective of how much they offend. Because there is hope for every man. Just behave like God. If you were made in God's image, you should act like God. We were dirty in the garden. We sinned. We were full of stain and nakedness. God did not abandon us in our nakedness. He looked beyond our naked bodies. He looked beyond our naked hearts and our exposed hearts. He saw his future in us. In fact, he clothed us in his love. That's why he punishes our sin. He clothed us in love. Prepare for us a future where we can return to him in unity. So let this same mind be in you that was also in God. It doesn't matter how much dirty or evil somebody has committed. Don't ask for their head. Seek, let your love supersede your anger. Let the love of God in you be the first thing you reason when you look at people's sin and depravity. And this will help you to relate to them even when everyone disregards them and push them aside. Watch out if you think you know better. The gospel message never changes. But the way of presenting it must be adapted. Otherwise, one, no one will ever understand the gospel. Why you are there and what you are trying to say. Because if not the way you present yourself. If you do not present the gospel yourself before you present the gospel, people will never listen to the gospel. I have grown long in the mission to understand people respect the missionary even before they respect his word. Your character and your conduct among the people will make people to see Christ in you. And that's why the songwriter said, let others see Jesus in you. While you are passing through this world of sin, your life is a book before their eyes. They are reading you true and true. And they are asking themselves one question. Does your life point them to the sky? Or does your life point them to the grave? Remember the unbelievers are not illiterate. Or nor are the village dwellers or the rural dwellers who are going to say illiterate. They are not listening to your message. They are watching you. You that say, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You that say thou shalt not steal, do you rob idol tents? Maybe you are one of those missionaries. You preach in the day about idol worship and you collect the idols and sell it. How are you different from the people you are preaching to? 
The gospel is first heard and then understood by the conduct of those who present the gospel. In order to see the conversion to Christ and change from serving false God, there has to be rapports between the people and you. They must trust you enough to be able to ask you questions. And they must trust you not to be offended when you are asked questions, to communicate your message in a plain language that they will understand. You must understand the people, and the people must understand you. And this is, this means the same to me as to you, transformation of new believer life to confirm true conversion. There has to be a transformation. Remember what Paul said, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul was a follower of Christ. He see Jesus in himself. And he was bold enough to tell his follower to follow his footstep because he knew his footstep would lead them to Christ. So let others see the same Jesus in you. So that when you are passing through this world of sin, your life is a book before their eyes. They will read you true and true. And they will ask themselves more questions. The life you are living, is it the life I want? Does this life take me to heaven? Or if I follow your footsteps, will I not end up like the rest in hell? That is the question every Christian asks each other. The key number one is world view. A person's world view is how a man or woman view God. Himself, eternity. Conversion, change has to happen. Here before culture slowly begins to conform to God's word. Before you speak to the people, you are called. You are called to. You must take time to understand how they see lives. How do they view life? Their worldview might be very religious and involve God and gospel. It might be secular, such as masses or atheism. From this foundation come all their habits, belief, practice, value, good or bad. Paul got it right. So can you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, chapter 1 and 2, we read, how pagan people turn from idol to serve the living God, true God. The living and true God. Paul said that the gospel came to them in not simply with words. So let's learn three things that we are so involved in this gospel. Lifestyles that brought rapports. They saw at least 12 quality in Paul's life. So they imitated him, even as certain suffering. First Thessalonians chapter 2, from verse 3 to 8. First Thessalonians 2, from 3 to 8. It says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guilt, but we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so, we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering word, as we know, nor a cup of covetousness, God is weakness. None of men sought with glory, neither of you nor yet of order, when we might have been bothersome as the apostle of Christ, we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children, so even affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own soul, 
because ye were dear unto us. Did you get that? They were not only ready to impart the gospel, but they impart their own soul. Because why? They see you as an object to be loved. Even your deliverance and your healing will not take place, except you love the better. From verse 10 to 12, we understand. We witness, we are witnesses, and God also. How holy and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believes. And as ye know how we exalt and confront and change every one of you as father doth his son, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. That is what Paul said, and that is how he behaved himself. He's not just preaching, oh, for John 3 16, for God so loved the world. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You love God so much, how many minutes of your time in a day do you give God? God, oh, God loves us so much. Jesus only is our message. Jesus, all our things shall be. Save your sanctifier, healer, baptizer, and communicator. Is Jesus only your message? Is Jesus only your thing will be? You say God loves you so much, He gave His only begotten Son. And yes, the church roof is leaking. You say, hmm, that one of their business. What? God so loves you, and He gave His only begotten Son, and you love God so much, you don't even join the team on evangelism. How dwelleth the love of God in you? You see your brother hungry, you shut up your bow of compassion. How do the love of God in you? The questions remain. Christianity does not only impact the world, we impact ourselves as well. Communication and understanding, they welcome and understood the message enough to turn from their idols. Don't force people to go to the shrine on notice to go and burn the idol, the idol will kill you. The reason is because you do not even know the God you are going to serve. Before the people through the Bible bring the idol to the point, the pastor did not force them to go and collect the idols. The idol were brought by the people, and the pastor helped them to burn it. But you, as a minister who went to hunt for idol, the idol will hunt for you because you are not the one to hunt for the idol. The people who are converted genuinely. Who understand the power of God that dwells in you we surrender their idol to the pot. And that is how we do deliverance. Paul ways of doing ministry. He worked for living just like any other person. Oh, God says, as a minister, if I work, I will die. That, where did you hear it? God did not tell any minister not to work. Paul worked for a living, he was a tent maker. And he remained a tent maker even while he was going from mission field to mission. Even when he dwells in Achaia, he was there with people of the same craft who were tent makers like him. He abided in their house, followed them to work, at the same time preached the gospel. Nobody preached the gospel for 24 hours a day. So as long as you don't preach the gospel for 24 hours a day, you have time to work. That's why the Bible says, study to be quiet and to do that own labor. Christian must learn to walk. Because the Bible says if you will not walk, you should not eat. And I stand by that word. He ministers in Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. What does it say? For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know that the manner of men will be among you for your sake. The gospel you preach, power must proceed your message. People must know you are not just a good orator. 
that your word carry power. That you say it and it come to pass. You decree it and it is established. And they will listen. When they something, I always ask my mission team one question. How much will somebody pay you to die? Will somebody send you to a mission field where you know that you will ask for your head without the Holy Spirit you will agree to go? No. The apostles were willing to put their life on the line to preach the gospel. Do you know why? Conviction. If you don't bring the right conviction to your member, they will not be willing to die for the gospel. Only those who have come to understand God are willing to die on behalf of God. In the 1970s, Moravian missionaries even entered leper cronies. Why? Why would somebody be brave enough? At this time, we do not even have antibiotics that can take care of leprosy. But they were ready to put their life on the line to make sure that the lepers receive the gospel. They entered leper cronies to become lepers, to win lepers. And become slaves to win slaves. Today, in the Philippines, missionaries choose to live among the poor to win them for Christ. In the Sahel missionary, Ken Smith lives in the Fulani hut, has a Fulani car, eat Fulani food, dress in Fulani robe, speak Fulani language. It's just the beginning to win Fulani for Christ. For you to be able to win them, you must be like them. Resetting people and separating others will not help you to be a good missionary. God expects us to learn the same principle, be filled with the same spirit, having the same mind that Christ had. He was in form of a God. He did not see it as a thing of robbery to be equal with God. But rather he humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation and he became obedient, even unto the point of death. Even such a shameful death on the cross. But then this is where we end our teaching for today. We want you to join us again next Tuesday or on Sunday by 5 p.m. where we, um, we teach the topic Understanding Biblical Prophecy. Last week, we start by teaching on the wrath of God. And the wrath of God will continue throughout this month. And God bless you as you listen. Brethren, before we pray, I would just want to invite you, if you are new to this message, you have missed our subsequent lesson. These lessons are taken in series. We always take in four series. Four series on evangelism, four series on mission, four series on discipleship, four series on leadership, and four series on church road. When we finish, this today marks the end of the first series of mission. So by next week, we are starting first series on discipleship. So if you have missed any of this series, you can easily go to our website. And our website is cgfnslogin. cgfnslogin.app So cgfnslogin.app Or you can go to Facebook and type CGF Open Heart Fellowship. Most of our messages are also available there. Brethren, we will be happy to see you once again. You can also register for our mission program and join most of our courses. You are always welcome and God bless you as you participate. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again. We are happy for your people who have heard the truth because you said in your word, if thou Hearken unto the voice, look unto the laws of liberty that set free. Thou art blessed if thou continue. Brethren, your people have heard your word today. They have looked into the perfect law of liberty that set free. Lord, I pray that as many that look, they will continue. They will mind the same spirit. They will not only impact the word with the word of God, they will also be able to impact with their own soul. They will also be able to teach the people that others should see Jesus in them. Even when they are passing through this world of sin, they will know that their life is a book before the eyes of the world, that they are reading them true and true, and they are asking themselves one simple question, does my life point people to the sky? 
Does my life take people to heaven? If somebody does what I do, will it make it to heaven? If somebody go to church the way I go to church, will it make it to heaven? If somebody study the Bible the way I do, will it go to heaven? If somebody preach the gospel the way I do, will it make it to heaven? Lord, you say we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Every other thing we ask in this world will be added unto us. Lord, as we seek first your kingdom today and your righteousness, let everything that are blocked be loosed. Let everything that are bound be set free. Let everything that are in captivity receive divine freedom. Father, let everything that are hanging down, O oh Lord, be exalted. Let every valley in the life of this believer be exalted. Let every high land and heal be made low in their life. Lord, I decree healing to as many that are saved. As many that have blind receive your sight. As many that sit in darkness, O oh Lord, great light is shining. O oh Lord, my God, you say, let it that is laid not be torn out of the way. Let them rather be healed. And I decree to you, lay that are standing on the way. We receive your healing. Stand up and run in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive the grace to do the impossible. Oh Lord, as many that are desirous to preach your word, they lack the Holy Spirit. I breath upon you today. I say, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And let the fruit of God be multiplied upon you. That as you go in Jesus' name, the signs will follow you. If you will obey this voice today and go. In his name, you will cast out them. You will heal all manner of disease. Lay your hand upon the sick. They will recover. Only if you obey and go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Bedroom, we will be happy to see you again by next week. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.